Well, thank you for coming out this evening, everybody. I'm John Ramsey with the Center for Agricultural Economy. Um, I, I think the last time that I had this many people staring at me in the auditorium here was, uh, let's see, it was uh, 1995, and I was a senior in high school as part of the talent show competition. So. Um, <laughs> Hopefully this evening goes better than that did. Um, so um, how, I'm not going to try that again, no. Um, I think this is an important moment just to uh, offer the community a chance to learn more about the Yellow Barn Project, um, hear some information about it, uh, have some questions answered. And I also want to just be very clear that I work for the Center for Agricultural Economy and there are many, many partners involved in this project. The town, the Northeast Kingdom Development Corporation, Jasper Hill, uh, Cabot Creamery, uh, Northwest, Northeastern Vermont Development Association. Um, and I will do my best to answer all the questions that I can, but I am also not here uh, fully representing all of those other folks. So um, I just wanted to say that. And also, um, when we get to the Q&A session of this evening, um, I'm happy to repeat the question so that everybody can hear the question. Um, and Arthur, is the mic on down here if someone would like to come up and speak? Okay. So. Either let me know what the question is and I'll repeat it or you can uh, speak into the microphone down front um, for your question. Um, we do have um, local Hardwick TV here and uh, so the session is being recorded. And um, just to give you a little bit of an overview of how the evening will go, I'm going to give an update and an overview of the work of the Center for Our Cultural Economy. And then I'm gonna go into specific details about the Yellow Barn project. And then we're gonna leave a lot of time for Q&A and conversation. If there's burning questions or things that need clarification as I go along, I'm happy for you, you, know, you to, um, to let me know that I need to clarify something. Um, but we are gonna hold a, a good chunk of time at the end for, for questions and answers, so. Does that sound, does that sound good? Okay. Well, and again, thank you so much for coming out. I think this is a, this is a really important opportunity. Um, the Center for Our Cultural Economy, we wanted to uh, put this on in part because um, when we operationalize our new space in the new building, there will be community intersection with that. And this is uh, actually step one of some community outreach that we intend to do about this project. Uh, we are also gonna do some outreach later this summer or early fall. So just, just FYI on that. Um, so the work of the Center for Agricultural Economy um, has deep intersections with this local community. And um, much of our work can be very behind the scenes and some of it is very um, out in front in, in, in terms of the community. Um, this is a community meal that um, our staff uh, help put on every month um, at the United Church in Hardwick. Um, it's one of the examples of the work that we're doing uh, you know, in partnership um, with the community. Um, we envision a future with healthy working lands, abundant and accessible local food, and communities where everyone can thrive. So those are the broad goals by which we're approaching this work and this project. Our work um, takes, again, a lot of different shapes and forms. We have programs, um, which we put capacity behind, staffing capacity. Uh, there are places that the Center for Agricultural Economy manages. Uh, currently, uh, Atkins Field, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. Uh, also, the Vermont Food Venture Center. That's our existing facility, which is on Junction Road, um, right behind Abishans. And then the new building, um, or half of the new building, and we have yet to come up with a name for our new space there. So that will be part of what we talk about um, later this evening as well, is what do we call that new space. Um, our work takes the shape and form of projects um, where we're taking ideas from the community and implementing them 
Uh, and we also work in deep partnership with so many, so many others. Um, Hardwick Area Food Pantry, the Hardwick Farmers Market, Northeast Kingdom Organizing, the Civic Standard, Green Mountain Farm to School, and we're, we're also in very deep partnership with the uh, OSSU Supervisory Union. Um, as well as a vast array of many other partners across the state like the Intervale Center, Food Connects in Brattleboro, uh, Acorn in Addison. Um, our network is quite vast, but here in the Hardwick community, um, those are our key partnerships that um, we actually implement programming with. Over the last four years, um, there has been tremendous growth at CAE as we've navigated a lot of different things as a community. Um, and one of the things that sort of kicked off this growth of CAE was uh, in 2019, uh, Farm Connects, which at the time uh, was an independently operated business, uh, was at risk of closing. And that was a local food aggregation and distribution service that was serving many uh, local farms, uh, getting their, their food from farm to place to market. Um, and January 1 of 2020, the Center for Agricultural Economy took on the ownership and the management of Farm Connects. And since that time, I believe there's been two days in which we haven't run service, uh, meaning kept our trucks on the road and our drivers who do such a, you know, amazing work uh, moving food um, all around the state and locally. Um, I think it was the day, it was, uh, the day after Thanksgiving of 2020 when we had our first COVID uh, positive test and uh, recently this summer after the flood, we were, we were, we were closed and shut down uh, with Farm Connects for I think two days. Um, but that has been it since, uh, since January 1 of 2020. Um, so just shout out to our amazing staff, so thank you. Um, immediately following the onboarding of uh, Farm Connects, uh, COVID arrived and Farm Connects, Center for Agricultural Economy, our community program staff, um, we became very deeply involved in a number of emergency response efforts. Uh, throughout the pandemic, uh, CAE was an Everyone Eats hub. Um, Bethany's here, I know she is, um, and uh, was very involved when uh, Everyone Eats was created as a statewide program. Uh, and through the pandemic, uh, I, I believe CAE uh, helped facilitate over 90,000 meals for the community. Um, and we were able to work with uh, Buffalo Market, um, Village Restaurant, uh, Cajun Madeira, uh, Front Seat Coffee, House of Pizza, um, as all of a way in which to continue to help those businesses through COVID. Um, we were also able to uh, facilitate many grocery vouchers, which people in the community were able to utilize at places like Crassberry and Albany Jenny, Willie's Store, Smith's General Store, Buffalo Market. Uh, we worked in deep collaboration with all of those uh, local businesses so that folks uh, were getting food, you know, and uh, able to get what they needed through the pandemic. Um, we also um, became, uh, you know, uh, Farm Connects, which we had just onboarded, um, became a means by which um, shift meals, which the Scandi Pancake were doing, uh, became a means for distributing those meals to further reaches of the Northeast Kingdom, Franklin County. Um, we were delivering a lot of food to places like farm stands where a lot of people were shopping. Um, and we also uh, participated in the USDA uh, Farmers Feeding Families program where we were uh, packing produce boxes uh, in our facility at the Food Venture Center, uh, pivoting much of the produce that was intended to go to schools and colleges um, that we had uh, made agreements with, with farms to buy. We pivoted all that produce uh, to food access sites uh, through the USDA Farmers Feeding Families program. Um, and then, of course, this past summer, um, again, in partnership with so many in Hardwick, the town, um, you know, Opie, just, yeah, looking at you <laughs> this past summer and all the work that you did, uh, you know, the Civic Standard, uh, Nico, the Rescue Squad, just so many people in Hardwick. Um, we were definitely there as part of that group responding to the flood uh, and all of those things. And we were able to get, again, grocery vouchers out the door. We started that, I think, the next day. Um, and then we also did, um, I think it was over $300,000 in emergency loans to farms that were affected through our revolving loan fund. Um, 
and that work um, that work continues. So, sorry, that was a long slide. Um, as, as CAE has grown, um, some of our programs are now statewide or even multi-state. You know, we go into New Hampshire with, with some things, with Farm Connects and other things. But really, you know, we've always focused on the Hardwick area and the greater Hardwick community. Um, and this is really where our community connections and our intersections with the community uh, live and thrive. And we don't intend to, um, you know, have place-based education programming across the state. But here in partnership with the supervisory union. Many of you know Reeve. Um, she's over there by the door. Um, she works in you know close collaboration with all of the OSSU, OSSU schools, um, and also uh, co-teaches a class here at Hazen called Recipe for Human Connection, um, which helps facilitate that monthly community meal that I was um, speaking about earlier. Um, through our community connections work. Um, there is a lot of other things happening around food sovereignty and food access, um, emergency preparedness. Produce to pantries is something that emerged after the USDA Farmers Feeding Families program. Uh, we basically took that model and uh, localized it and we we're working with very, very small uh, local produce growers, um, getting produce into the Hardwick, Craftsbury, Albany, um, the emerging Barton and the Holland food pantry sites. Um, so that's where we we're uh, purchasing that directly uh, from farms and moving that to um, to pantries. Um, let's see. I also wanted to give a quick shout out that uh, through the summer, the uh, Thursday community meal, which is the third Thursday of every month, June, July, and August, our staff are going to be helping put that on. If you're interested, uh, Reeve is right over there, and I'm sure you can um, find a way to, to connect with her if you're interested in supporting that. Um, yes, <laughs> uh, free for everybody. And then also Monday evenings. Um, at Atkins, there's going to be another community meal uh, this summer, I think from 4 to 5.30. Um, Starts at 5, start 4 is just for setup. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, so these are, you know, these are all of the different intersections with community. Um, Atkins Field, again, many of you know this place and have visited it. Um, this is where the um, community garden, the community orchard, um, a lot of recreation, activities that the town uh, intersects with, recreation, education, workshops. Um, and we're also looking at ways in which we can continue to build out Atkins Field with climate resiliency in mind. Um, so Atkins, um, I think everyone knows, or if you're not aware, did flood last summer. And the pavilion that we constructed and opened in the fall of 2019, the Hoop House, which is over on the uh, far slide from me, the um, community orchard, they were all fine after the flood in part because they were designed to have water flow through them and around them. Um, so we're taking a new approach with the community gardens. Um, some of these garden beds that you see over here are no longer there. We've raised the growing. We're implementing a hugo culture design. So we're actually raising, um, raising up where the growing occurs uh, and orienting them so that, again, if Atkins were to flood, water would flow through uh, the property. Um, so we really want to continue to build out Atkins as a you know, shared space with the community, as a place for education and intersection with food access and food sovereignty. Um, this is also a place where we're in deep partnership right now with the town of Hardwick, um, doing uh, community listening and uh, really, um, you know, getting um, uh, conversations started with neighbors around some of the challenges that our community is uh, facing right now. Um, so this is a real intersection of place and people and food. Uh, and, you know, over time we want to continue to invest in Atkins um, and uh, as a place for, for this community. Pivoting a little bit, um, we also work with a lot of farms and a lot of food businesses. And one thing that we um, do on a regular basis is uh, support farm and food businesses um, 
with that entails uh, an enterprise analysis, a cash flow analysis. Uh, we've actually started to um, help farms uh, figure out succession planning um, where um, we're helping to uh, have a farm transfer from one generation to the next. So our uh, business services staff is very involved in that type of work. Um, one of our staff members, her focus really is on dairy and supporting uh, organic uh, dairy and supporting dairy farmers uh, the best is what we can. We all know dairy farming is super challenging. I grew up dairy farming. I know all about it. Um, it's a lot of work and uh, you know we're trying to provide services to you know any type of farm out there you know whether it's a dairy farm or a small produce farm or a grain farm um, and our business services team really fans out through the through the region um, working with farms at whatever technical assistance they need um, the Farm Fund is our revolving loan program, uh, which was started in partnership and collaboration with, with Pete's Greens. Um, Pete's Greens had a devastating fire a number of years ago, and as a way to pay it forward, uh, this revolving loan fund was started. Uh, again, this, this uh, play is a, played a role front and center in the emergency response efforts from the flood last year. Um, but in total, in the last um, 16 months or so, we've actually loaned uh, $1.1 million to farms across Vermont. Uh, those are, uh, the emergency loans are made at 0% interest, and the business builder loans are made at 3% interest. Uh, our loan cap is $30,000. Um, so these are not huge loans, but they facilitate a lot of projects um, with food producers and on farms and help leverage other financing uh, and, 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 other, um, and other projects that they're doing. Um, through grassroots fundraising, contributions by individuals, we've been able to grow the revolving fund now to about $1.3 million that is actually revolving um, at about an 80% deployment uh, continuously. So we're able to make loans, those loans are repaid, and then we re-lend that money. So that's the way that's, um, that's been building there. Um, the Food Venture Center is our existing facility um, behind Abishan's. Um, it is a shared use facility that serves a number of different functions. Um, and uh, I'm gonna sort of go right to the next slide. At any given time, there are 20 or 30 businesses utilizing that space. Um, businesses in that space receive food safety training, um, training on uh, equipment. Um, we do a lot of um, cross docking there, so, um, uh, front seat coffee, uh, local donut, patchwork farm, I think Buffalo Market, um, um, I'm forgetting all of them, uh, have shipments of deliveries uh, made to the Food Venture Center and then they pick up their, uh, their products there. So it's, we have this cross docking arrangement with a number of businesses. Um, there's a number of businesses that are using our limited storage there right now, cold storage, frozen storage. Um, and then the clients who are using the kitchens um, are making a variety of different products. And um, I think it was a couple weeks ago on WCAX, uh, Green Mountain Peanut Butter was featured as a Made in Vermont segment. Um, and that actually is a business utilizing the, the Food Venture Center. So an example of businesses that grow, receive services while they're there, and then either graduate or they decide, no, I don't want to make salsa for the rest of my life. And I'm glad that I went to a facility and that didn't buy all of that equipment before deciding that. So. Um, it's a place for people to you know, incubate their businesses, grow them. Um, it's also the home of Just Cut. And Just Cut, um, which I will get to in a second, um, but this is inside the, the, the Food Venture Center. So it sort of gives you an idea of um, our space limitations. Um, 
Um, there's uh, some limited capacity, like I said, for uh, cold and frozen storage there. Um, but it's, you know, we've, we've really sort of maxed out the, the space inside of the Food Venture Center. Um, the kitchens are used nearly on an everyday basis. Um, Jasper Hill is still utilizing um, part of the building that was uh, essentially set up when the, uh, the building opened in 2011. They're still making all of their soft cheeses there, Harbison, Willoughby, all of those things are made uh, at the creamery at the Food Venture Center, go to Greensboro for aging, then come back for fulfillment and distribution. Um, so at the Food Vendor Center, we have a lot going on. And um, you know, the new building and the space that we're building out, um, we really are trying to complement those two spaces um, so that it removes some of the bottlenecks that we're experiencing in this facility. Um, so Just Cut um, is a program where we sign good faith agreements uh, with local farms. We buy that produce. Uh, that produce goes to the Food Venture Center and our staff prepare it into cuts that are easily used um, in schools, hospitals, and colleges. Uh, the produce that we're buying is really not the produce that farms would be sending to the retail market. It's maybe it has some defects or it's like grown oversized and this is a great way to create a market for farms. Um, um, and again, we're taking sort of the, the middle out of it so the farms don't have to, you know, prepare the cuts themselves. They don't have to aggregate it. They don't have to distribute it. Um, we literally buy it from them, go pick it up with Farm Connects, uh, bring it to the Food Venture Center, and then prepare it into, um, into uh, prepared cuts. Uh, Hardwick Elementary, Hazen, um, UVM Dining, you know, we're, we're able to distribute that, those prepared produce products, um, you know, through a number of different schools and colleges uh, and hospitals across Vermont, as well as keeping a lot of it local. Uh, last year, we processed roughly 170,000 pounds of local produce, which equated to over 400,000 servings of local produce on institutional meals in colleges and uh, schools and hospitals. So um, between the Produce to Pantries program and Just Cut, that's you know, well over 200,000 pounds of local produce that we're moving from farm to food pantry sites or schools, hospitals, and colleges. Um, so this is sort of giving you a sort of a step-by-step, -step, you know, we get, we receive the produce, it's prepared, um, gets packed, and then is sent out through shipping, and most of that shipping occurs through, um, through Farm Connects. So Farm Connects, um, and this is really where I'm going to start to um, bring it together as to why I'm talking so much about CAE and then <laughs> talking about the new facility. Um, so Farm Connects um, is a aggregation, distribution, fulfillment, and logistics service. Um, we're working with nearly 100 producers. Um, we're working with many of them, local Northeast Kingdom farms, but we also have producer relationships with like Stratford Organic Creamery. So if you're at Buffalo Market and you're seeing Stratford Organic um, uh, creamery, milk, um, in the glass bottles, um, that arrive there via Farm Connects and the work that we do with Stratford. Um, it isn't um, just a service where we're picking up things and moving them from point A to point B. Um, like with Butterworks, we are actually helping fulfill orders and get their product into the store shelves. Um, with Green Mountain Farm to School, they have an online ordering platform. Uh, we're aggregating that product, we're picking and packing those orders, and then distributing that food for them. Um, so we are a very robust service in the beginning, middle, and end of the local food supply chain. Um, let's see. Let's go to the next slide. Um, this sort of gives you a little bit of a snapshot of what the service entails. Um, last year, um, th uh, 13.5 million in local food um, went through this service. Those are all those are all represent sales for farms. Um, 
There are a lot of relationships that we uh, help facilitate between other food hubs and other um, groups like Deep Root Organic Co-op, uh, which is a, um, I think there are 17 member farms in Vermont, um, organic produce growers. Uh, we aggregate for Deep Root Organic and then we also deliver for Deep Root Organic. Um, we work with Myers Produce, uh, Green Mountain Farm to School, um, and we have roughly 500 different stops that we do, maybe not on a weekly basis, but an annual basis. Um, help me, Corey, how many stops in a week, roughly? Two, 275 to 300 stops a week. Um, this is a service that works seven days a week um, and requires a lot of overnight shifts to basically receive food in at the end of the day. It's literally hitting our warehouse um, in there for a couple of hours and then going, um, going back out the, the door on trucks. But again, um, part of what is you know, driving the need for uh, additional facilities at CAE is um, Farm Connects really has no space at the Vermont Food Venture Center. Um, so this, this facility that we're currently leasing um, is on Industrial Park Road, Industrial Drive, um, and it's a one, one loading dock warehouse. Uh, we have five refrigerated box trucks, um, so that obviously creates some severe bottlenecks. Um, and as you can see, this is sort of typical of what the, the space can look like on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday night. Um, we're not holding the, the product very long, but the logistics and the sort of game of Tetris of moving pallets from one truck to the next truck, uh, back onto the other truck, um, you know, an additional space that is adequate to the work that you know we're doing um, will help um, really create uh, help eliminate some some bottlenecks that we're experiencing with the service. We actually had to pause onboarding new producers who want to use the service because we literally couldn't fit more food through this space um, at any one given time. So I'm going to kind of do a, a hard pivot into the Yellow Barn project and um, hopefully that um, intro to CAE gives you a little bit of an insight of how we might operationalize our space and um, what, um, what we might be doing there. Um, let's see here. So, <clears throat> So 2017 is when um, I believe this project really started to sort of form as a concept. Uh, my understanding is that um, the new facility and the renovation of the Yellow Barn were always linked as a project together. Um, and really, um, NVDA um, really sort of got behind this project um, and was viewing it as one of the most critical uh, rural economic development projects in the region. Um, alongside the rail trail, um, they identified this as a project that would have a lot of economic benefit for uh, the surrounding communities. Um, and there were some benchmarks that um, this project had to meet in order to um, in order to uh, receive the funding that it has. And one of them was on job creation. And currently, um, my understanding is that there's uh, 25 jobs uh, planned for the new facility, for, for both of the buildings, the Yellow Barn and the new building, um, from the tenants that will be utilizing the space there. Um, it was 2019 um, that the town bought the property. Uh, the property was identified as a brownfield, a uh, corrective action plan was approved um, and always has always been part of the project. Um, a lot of you probably saw the big pile of dirt that was down on Wright Farm Road. Um, that dirt was approved for removal um, up to the Coventry landfill to be used as daily cover. Um, that was all part of the corrective action plan that um, was put in place and implemented through our work with the, with, uh, with the state. The original concept for the project was three or four maker spaces in the Yellow Barn uh, as sort of a graduation space from folks coming out of the Food Venture Center, as well as a new building um, that was roughly 35,000 square feet. Um, so 
10 or yeah, 10 to 12,000 square feet bigger than the current structure uh, was the original plan. And that was predominantly for Jasper Hill cheese aging. And there were two to three other smaller tenant spaces uh, in the new building um, in the original concept uh, for other tenants. Um, so this is 2017 to 2019 sort of um, steps being taken around the project. 2020 to 2022, major, major shifts in the project. Um, the first design was well over budget. So that uh, bid, there, there was a public bid process as there always ha you know, needs to be in a large um, project like this with a lot of federal funds. Um, that, but that bid came in, I think it was April of 2022, and it was very, very over budget to the point where you know, the town, Northeast Kingdom Development Corporation, NVDA, um, really didn't see a path forward with the current um, design um, that had been um, talked about 2017 to 2019. Um, and Eric, if I get something really wrong, just... You're on track. Okay, all right. <laughs> um, also, there had been a couple of businesses identified as interested in using space in the Yellow Barn and also in the new building, and a lot of those businesses uh, during COVID pivoted. Um, and some of them you know, were not sure if they wanted to continue with the project. Some of them decided not to continue with the project. Um, in 2020, there was a request for proposal process that the town, NVDA, CAE, and others supported where we were uh, trying to replace those tenants that um, had you know, originally been interested and then uh, decided to exit the, the project at that time. Um, if I'm remembering correctly, the um, OSSU Supervisory Union had um, some light interest in some space for offices, but really nothing else was turning up at the time. And in order to keep the funding that had already been committed to the project, um, the town, um, Northeast Kingdom Development Corporation, uh, needed to demonstrate that they had tenants um, for the project that were committed to the project at that time, even though at the time there were a lot of big questions and marks around whether the project was even going to continue. Um, and at the time, because we had onboarded Farm Connects and had been involved in so many emergency response efforts, we had some real need emerging around infrastructure. We also had a staff that was growing very quickly. We were quickly running out of office space. Um, so it was in that, that time frame um, that CAE became interested in utilizing some space in the new building. Um, originally, CAE was not even on the radar as being a tenant um, in the project. So just FYI on that. So in 2022, after the uh, public bid came in way over budget, um, this is how the project pivoted to maintain uh, going forward. Um, the building size shrunk, first of all. Um, the tenants in the new building are receiving a shell. So Center for Agricultural Economy and Jasper Hill are the two tenants in the new building. We're receiving a floor, walls, and a roof. Um, so all of the uh, electrical, mechanical, plumbing, heating, refrigeration, uh, office space, that became up to the tenants to not only fund, but to facilitate the fit up and the construction of all of those interior pieces. Um, the lease rates were recalculated um, and we were able to keep all of the funders on board. Um, EDA, which is a federal funder, um, really at the time, I think, was nearly ready to sort of back out of the project. And again, the Yellow Barn renovation and the new building were always intrinsically linked as a project together. So losing, you know, three million of federal money would have meant we probably wouldn't have been able to do the barn. But um, at the same time, uh, Cabot emerged as uh, a, a tenant for the Yellow Barn. Uh, they stepped forward and indicated an interest in utilizing the Yellow Barn for a retail space. Um, and all, you know, through 2020, um, a lot of work was done to keep funding in place, um, maintain commitments with tenants, um, do the complete redesign, and um, 
essentially keep the whole the whole project on track. That was a that was a pretty big um, scope of work and um, took a lot of capacity by all partners involved. So where are we now? Um, the town is the owner of the property, um, the barn, and an owner of the shell of the new building. Um, I keep referring to the Northeast Kingdom Development Corporation. Um, that is a separate entity which has signed a ground lease with the town of Hardwick and is essentially the responsible party for the project. Um, the NEKDC uh, actually is the entity that we have signed a lease with, that Cabot has signed a lease with, and that Jasper Hill has signed a lease with. So their ground lease with the town allows them to um, sign those leases with us as the other tenants. Um, and they're responsible for all of the, uh, the management, uh, the finances, um, and as I believe they're also responsible for the long-term debt. Um, so they have taken on, when I say they, the Northeast Kingdom Development Corporation, um, they have sort of taken on that aspect of the project um, for the town and for all of the partners involved. This is a rendering that Co & Co, the architecture firm that's been working on the project since the beginning, provided as uh, sort of the finished, the finished concept. Um, let's see. The lease payments from the tenants cover the, uh, the pilot, the payment in lieu of taxes, um, the long-term debt. Um, there's approximately $1.5 million of long-term debt. Um, that the NEKDC will hold um, lease payments from the tenants, um, pay that debt. They pay the uh, payment in lieu of taxes directly to the town, obviously with it being owned by the municipality. It is not taxed, um, but there is a payment that goes to the town. I believe um, the last I looked, it was $27,000, but don't quote me on, don't quote me on that, yeah. Um, lease payments also pay for property upkeep and maintenance um, and all three tenants are leasing their space on a per square foot basis. Our lease I think is $8.60 per square foot um, and what we're getting is again the shell. So Cabot is doing the final finishing touches on the retail fit up inside of the yellow barn. Jasper Hill and CAE um, are entirely responsible for the interior construction, uh, plumbing, heating, mechanical, electrical, refrigeration, and equipment inside of the, the new building. Um, this really will give us adequate space to meet you know, the needs of farmers and um, have greater community uh, resilience in the face of emergencies. Um, there have been a number of instances where, um, again, we have turned producers away from our services because of a lack of infrastructure. Um, you know, all combined, I believe CAE's um, work is facilitating over $15 million of local economic activity in the local food system annually. Um, and this space will allow us to continue to grow, um, to grow that and to continue to grow the local food, um, the local food economy. Um, after a lot of consideration, um, CAE has decided to proceed with a net zero design of our new space. So we're leasing half of the new building, 50%, 12,000 square feet. And the Vermont Food Venture Center has been a place since it opened that has provided numerous ideas to numerous businesses and partners and organizations you know, across Vermont and you know, literally across the country. It's, you know, we are a very open book when it comes to what it takes to operationalize the Food Venture Center, what it takes to co the, the, cost of, you know, the cost of operating it, how we you know, manage it as a shared use facility. Um, and we are committed to a net zero design that we would be more than welcome to, again, share with partners and other producers um, you know, as we move forward with um, climate you know, ready infrastructure that you know, really meets the goals um, that we need to set um, in, the, in the face of, of climate change. So we are moving forward with um, 
5,000 square feet of space that's going to be dedicated to perishable local food. So there will be a space that's, you know, cold storage, frozen storage, and a root crop storage space. Um, and we're going to keep that under temperature with a very, very energy efficient refrigeration system that utilizes CO2 as a natural refrigerant, not refrigerants that have hydrofluorocarbons and harmful greenhouse gas emissions. Um, it operates um, in a way that is uh, incredibly energy efficient for um, the space. And um, again, hopefully it provides us with more um, adequate space to aggregate, distribute um, local, uh, local products so that our farms can access not only local markets, but regional markets, which is really critical to the, to the long-term viability of, of many of them. This is a layout of our floor plan. So again, this represents half of the new building and to sort of work from this side of the auditorium over. Um, we will have three loading docks. Um, one of the loading docks will be a pit uh, loading dock. So if anybody here is, you know, um, driven up to the Food Venture Center in their Subaru or their pickup truck and sort of hefted product up the loading dock steps, that will no longer, uh, you'll no longer need to do that. We'll have a loading dock that actually goes up and down and sort of meets the, the various heights of all different types of vehicles, big and small, um, coming to the space. Um, we will have root storage space. Um, You'll sort of see the sidewalk. Um, that sidewalk is directly adjacent to Route 15. Um, that's where the roof along the side of the building is sort of coming out over along that sidewalk. Um, we'll have a large uh, cold storage space and a large uh, frozen storage space. Um, so this will be the new home of Farm Connects. Um, but also similar to the um, Food Venture Center, which is a shared use facility where farm businesses can come and utilize the equipment that's there without having to go buy their own, um, we will offer storage space to farms here as well. So um, uh, LeBlanc Family Farm, Snug Valley, um, uh, Black Dirt, um, schoolhouse and Callis, you know, these are all farms that are storing product with us currently at the Food Venture Center. And we have long turned many, many people away um, because we don't have adequate cold and frozen storage there for perishable food. Um, this will give us the opportunity to offer farms um, a safe place to store their products um, at appropriate temperatures. And um, again, you know, um, you know, be a shared use facility. We have a, uh, a space that identified as conference space right here. Uh, it's really a community space. Um, there is a uh, demonstration kitchen at one end of it for education, workshops, community events. Um, we imagine this to be a space utilized by the community. Um, and then at the far end, there are uh, offices. Uh, and what is not shown here um, is also a, uh, a mezzanine space, um, which we will also have access to. And you know, I don't. That could be a creative space. That could be a place where you know there's a desk there that you know farmers utilize, or a shared, you know, a shared use uh, space for um, for people who need a, a place to uh, to work. Um, so again, we're imagining this as a space that um, the community intersects with in a number of different ways. Um, I kind of jumped ahead to this already a little bit, but um, to put a little bit more detail around our, um, our net zero design, um, the refrigeration system really is the focal piece of it. Um, this is a um, picture of the refrigeration system that we're um, going to be receiving. So um, it essentially has six or eight compressors that all work at very low amperage. Think of a, a variable speed pump that doesn't come on at full force all at once, but you know can start gradually. This is that's similar to how this system operates, um, but it operates under high high pressure. And as it operates, it generates a lot of heat, and you can either you know use a big um, radiator to remove that heat or you can capture that heat and we intend to capture that heat and that uh, captured heat is actually going to be the primary heat source for our half of the building. Um, so we're really excited about um, all of that because again we want to share 
what we're doing. We want to share how we're doing it. We want to share, you know, um, how it works. <laughs> the, you know, the things that we find out that, that maybe don't work as well as that we hope that it's going to work. Um, so that other folks can take these ideas and implement them for uh, sustainable and climate ready uh, infrastructure design. Um, we have um, a couple of different um, proposals that we've looked at uh, for a solar array on the entire roof of the new building. Um, I should say CA's lease covers half of the, the ground, uh, ground floor space. Um, we also have a lease on the roof. Um, and uh, as backup heat, we have a wood pellet boiler going in, um, and then electric heat pumps in the rooftop handling units for uh, office cooling in the, in the summer. So a lot of work. Um, our board, many of our board members are here, were unanimous in their decision to move forward with the, <laughs> with the net zero design. And again, really want to sort of showcase this as something for the future and, you know, again, share what we learned for other producers and partners. Um, and again, you know, the mezzanine space, um, the community space, you know, how can we use, make this a dynamic space that um, the community can utilize um, and, um, and make, uh, you know, and make good use of. Um, so I was hoping we, that would take around 50 minutes and I think we're on track. <laughs> um, so that is the end of what I have prepared for this evening. Um, and I'm happy to answer any question that I can. And again, feel free to come up to the mic or I'm happy to repeat your question. So thank you. Um, our fit up budget is roughly 3.9 to 4.1 million dollars. Um, we have secured 2.4 million dollars and we've secured roughly another million in interim financing. Um, the solar array uh, is something that we would not install until we've received additional um, uh, funding for. So right now we're hoping that that's a spring of 2025 project. So between the financing that we've secured and the funding that we've secured in grants, um, our grant funding is roughly um, 600 in, our grant funding is uh, of the 2.4 million currently uh, is 671,000 of state and federal money and the rest is private contributions. Um, and um, so we intend to, um, you know, move forward, complete the fit up, and be in that space by the end of the year. Yeah. Uh, the question was about the new building and the floodplain. So as part of the permitting process uh, and the federal money, um, the FEMA reviewed and approved the uh, location and the design um, and signed off on the, the new building and the renovation of the, of the yellow barn. A third of our funding, or a little bit more than a third of our funding, come from fee for services. So Farm Connects uh, is a fee for service. Uh, we get um, some funds from selling the Just Cut product. Uh, we get funds from leasing the Food Venture Center. So 35% or so of our budget is um, earned revenue. Um, and then we get um, roughly, uh, you know, about a third from private contributions. And the rest are restricted grants, which are a mix of state, federal, and private foundation sources. Eric. Could I, I'd just like to offer one point of clarification. There was a, um, John talked early about the Brownfields program to remediate the site. Um, just want to clarify that that um, brownfield situation did not originate with Greensboro Garage. It was over where that new building is now, and it originated with the state of Vermont burying a bridge there years ago. <laughs> So the question was about landscaping and reducing the shock of the big warehouse. Um, my understanding is that there are some trees and shrubs plan, uh, planned um, uh, right along um, the side of the building. Um, there is a green space um, that will be that will be there with some small shrubs. Um, and then, you know, a lot of folks have said to me, could we have a mural on yes. the building? Um, I think the town would, I don't know if the town would have a permitting process. Not for murals. Not for murals, okay. We don't do that for art. 
Okay, okay. But I think um, there's been a lot of conversation about um, some kind of mural on this end of the building. Um, and yes, there is some, uh, some, some landscaping included in the, in the project. The sidewalk that's, along the, um, that's coming out on the side of the building right here along Route 15 um, will also have um, a, a wooden uh, railing along it. And um, again, we're going to have, oh yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, yeah, this is sort of the, the concept, um, and um, we will have solar on the roof, and then I believe that our silo for the wood pellets is going somewhere over here. It's the railroad right-of-way, it's the right-of-way of Route 15, um, an adjacent wetland in the floodplain, and situating the building in that um, configuration um, basically required the, the current placement. Yep. A um, couple weeks ago, Hazen's freezers went down and we were able to get a couple pallet spaces freed up at our facility to help them out. Um, but yeah, we we're hoping to move. So yes, we, we handle uh, a lot of meat through Farm Connects, dairy. Um, we work with 22 um, value-added dairy producers, I believe, with Farm Connects. Um, we also work with uh, some grain farms, produce farms, uh, four, four egg farms, Neil, four, four egg farms. Um, so, yep. Um, we, have, um, we have already created, we have actually already um, hired a number of staff. Uh, CAE currently is, I think, at 37 or 38 staff. Um, so we've been, you know, actually hiring uh, in anticipation of moving into this facility. Um, we're going to be launching another uh, job search process um, here um, pretty quickly at the beginning of July, directly related to this facility. Um, so we already are in that process. Um, and I can't, I don't know what specific plans Jasper Hill has or Cabot has for hiring, but I know that in order to retain the grants, the federal grants, state grants, uh, there was a commitment by all of the tenants and we actually have to report to um, Department of Labor when we go through hiring processes and report on um, job, on applicants, you know, and, and number of applicants received and all of those things, so. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think at least it's going to take us, you know, a year or two to sort of grow into that space. Um, I mean, my rough estimate is that um, Farm Connects would occupy at least half of the cooler space on day one, just being able to, um, you know, uh, actually have products staged in a way that was, um, you know, more functional than how we're doing it right now. Um, you know, we would fill out the freezer less so. Um, and then the root crop storage, you know, I think is something that we're curious about. Um, we've talked to a number of produce growers and we actually designed um, our root crop storage space so that you actually could, you know, break it into half into two zones. And so um, half of the root crop storage space we can either convert to frozen storage, cold storage, or keep as um, root crop storage. So we're trying to sort of go in this with the most flexibility as possible to, um, to fit up the space. Um, I will say that um, there are a number of organizations that have talked to us about some interest in either utilizing our services or working with us in more capacity once we have this space. Um, you know, certainly Green Mountain Farm to School, who we already work with, um, you know, uh, talking to Salvation Farms, we're talking to Vermont Food Bank, uh, the Harbeck Food Pantry. Um, so, you know, I think we're having, we're actively having those conversations. Um, and yeah, there's a number of, of not only producers, but partners interested in um, utilizing the space with us, so. Yeah, yeah. I just want to say, um, it's not a question. It's more just a, a thank you. Uh, having watched this whole project, not even that, but the Center for Ag and the Venture Center and everything from its inception, it blows my mind and I really appreciate what it's done for our community. It's just beautiful. And, uh, thank, you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. It's been quite the journey. Yes, it has. <laughs> um, little factoid, I think. I was the first storage client of the Venture Center. 
Well, thank you much. Thank you so much, everybody.